Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the uh, Microsoft AI for Earth uh, session. This Phosphor G. And we'll get started uh, with our first talk of this session. Um, so I'd like uh, I'd like to introduce Marcos Moreau uh, from the University College of London. I'll add him to the stream. Hello, Marcos. Hello, everyone. Uh, should I start sharing the screen? Sure. So before uh, joining University College of London, London in 2018, he completed his MSc dissertation on remote sensing for near real-time deforestation monitoring and co-developed the Open Change Detection Map project. Uh, Marcus' research in, uh, interests include GIS science, uh, information and communication technology, and human-computer interaction. So thanks for joining us, and uh, take it from here. Just checking, can you see my screen now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So hi, hi everyone. Um, first of all, thanks. Thanks for attending this talk, and thanks to the organizers for organizing the conference and and accepting our abstract. Uh, I'm Marcos Moreau, and I'm going to talk about uh, land use messaging uh, and mapping by land users. Uh, I'll present a few case studies and pay special attention to the recent case studies in Nigeria and, and Ethiopia. This is the, the structure of the presentation. Uh, I'll talk very briefly about the excites group uh, participation in citizen participation in GI science and inequality participation, uh, the social technical challenges a bit about the process and then I'll focus more on the technology that will be presented as as the case studies are presented. I will try to touch a bit on this concept, these four bullet points that are shown here. And then I'll finalize with the uh, relation or the links between community mapping and, and open data driven collaboration. So the extrinsity and science uh, or excites um, group it's an interdisciplinary group based at uh, the UCL Geography Department. And we work with um, local partners and uh, local and indigenous communities, uh, hunter gatherers, uh, farming, farmers, uh, pastoralists, agro-pastoralist communities in, in all these countries that, that you can see uh, uh, on the map on the, on the right. And to explain a bit more the uh, citizen science and extreme citizen science and geographical citizen science. There's this uh, diagram uh, very shortly. Uh, the citizen science, it's when non-professional scientists participate in scientific activities or scientific uh, projects. Uh, <clears throat> geographical citizen science uh, kind of restricts the boundaries of citizen science to those activities that deal with geographical information. And this is where this research can be situated at the intersection of these three circles and also at the intersection of these um, terms of subdisciplines, depending how, how we see them. And then when we talk about uh, extreme citizen science, that refers to um, taking to the, uh, to the extremities the citizen science or gen science in, in general. And by taking to the extremities uh, means that um, to try to increase the, the level of inclusiveness and the, the level of engagement of, of the participants. Uh, in terms of level of inclusiveness, it's that um, any citizen, regardless of uh, level of literacy, education or background, uh, participate in citizen science projects. And in, level, in terms of level of uh, engagement that participants do not only participate in the in the data collection phase but also in uh, in all or as many stages of the of the project starting from the problem definition and setting up the, the research questions then data collection data visualization analysis and ultimately taking action that's the ideal case scenario it's not always the case but that's that's the that's the goal um, so why why participation matter, matters? Um, 
we all know that the, the air surface is uh, mainly mapped by um, professional surveyors, geographers, uh, cartographers, now increasingly more uh, algorithm developers and volunteers or contributors uh, of open collaborative mapping projects. So these these uh, statements are especially true in, in remote rural areas. And the fact that uh, maps are non-neutral artifacts and also that maps are empty, empty or inexistent in most parts of the world, this has implication in the security of land rights and also in the knowledge that we have about how uh, we humans use the land. So to build a, a, a complete uh, planetary scale environmental management system, uh, there's the need to include the, the knowledge that land uses hold in the, in the mapping process. Um, otherwise, there's another obstacle to try to address the, the climate change challenge and also the, the, inequality, the inequality problem or rural poverty uh, problem. The, the number of challenges are uh, significant, uh, so there's a wide range of of them uh, we're not gonna go into detail here it's just to try to classify them uh, so starting from social challenges technological ones uh, security challenges and then institutional and legal challenges uh, in this next slide uh, this is a, um, a working diagram uh, that tries to connect um, the challenges with the practices to address them and then how this links to the level of citizen participation in, in land use mapping and ultimately the uh, security of land rights and land use knowledge. Uh, this is a simplification of reality, but it's, it's a way of, of, of linking them. So if, for instance, if we take the, the negative vertical axis, um, <coughs> if the green force vector is greater than the orange one, then the spiral expands at this point and that, in theory, increases the level of citizen participation in land use mapping, regardless of the equilibrium of forces in previous quadrants. And then moving to the positive quadrant, the same. The equilibrium of forces at this quadrant influences, in theory, the level of uh, security of land rights, land use rights, and, and land use uh, knowledge. Um, obviously, the function of the spiral is, is unknown, and it's, it's likely to be always uh, Unknown, given the, the complexity of of this environment. Now I'll, I'll talk very briefly about the process. Um, I think it's important to, to mention a bit the process and the methodology, and then I'll jump into the I'll jump into the technology. So all the projects that um, uh, were shown in the in the map at the beginning of the presentation start with the community engagement. And that's where the, the people uh, identify the issues. Then uh, we discuss how technology and maps can help, if, if at all. And if, and if this is the case, then um, the people decide what they want to map, how, how they want to map it, um, for what purpose, uh, what benefits this can bring, and especially um, what are the, pos the, the potential negative impacts of of these activities and once the, this is uh, somehow clear then the mapping process uh, or the data collection process uh, it starts and then it's the people that decide with whom this data that is collected is shared um, one of the goals is to um, enhance uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration and we'll talk more about this um, at, the, at the very end of the of the talk uh, very briefly about the, the methodology. Um, so the process starts with the free prior and informed consent to discuss what I just uh, mentioned in the previous slide. So positive impacts, negative impacts, and, and other, other issues that may arise during the discussion. And then in terms of uh, co-designing the technology, uh, the user-centered design approach is followed. So um, once um, it's there's a clear idea of what needs to be mapped. Then this is a paper prototype, um, both in terms of the, the icons. Um, I, I forgot to mention before that in, 
in many of the projects, uh, most of the participants or some of the participants uh, have low levels of literacy, so pictorial interfaces are, are critical. Uh, sometimes we use captions, but uh, pictorial interfaces are, are important. And so at this stage, um, the icons are either drawn or images are taken or, uh, that represent a specific feature. And then uh, on paper, we design the, the navigation flow of the app. Once there is a kind of ready prototype, then this is converted into an actual app, uh, which is called a Sapelli project. I'll explain it a bit, a bit later on. And then the testing uh, starts and the iterative process uh, goes on until everyone or most of the people are satisfied with the, with the solution. <laughs> the mapping, knowledge sharing and collaboration, I will go through it after presenting the uh, Sapelli ecosystem. Um, so these are the, the different tools that are being used in, in these projects. Sapelli Collector is the, the core one. Uh, Sapelli Collector is a, a mobile um, data collection tool that was uh, primarily uh, designed, not, not exclusively, but primarily designed for uh, non-literate users uh, to, to help them address whatever the issues are in their uh, local environments. Then Sapelli Collector um, transmit the data to GeoKey that provides the, the server-side components for participatory mapping. And then Community Maps uh, pulls the data from GeoKey uh, for visualization and analysis in, in a web map. Uh, recently, we started testing Sapelli Viewer, which is uh, another mobile app that uh, communicates with Sapelli Collector and allows for visualizing the data collected and conducting some basic or more advanced analysis depending on on the needs and it can it can work offline and yeah the idea is to integrate it uh, uh into so allow it to communicate with geokey as well but this is, is still a uh, work in progress um the other one is sapelli designer um which is the the app the desktop based app to design Sapelli projects. Uh, Sapelli projects uh, very briefly are like taking the, this, um, the example of uh, Open Data Kit, for instance, that use survey, survey forms. So Sapelli uh, projects are like a survey form that use pictorial interfaces. And in terms of technical detail, it's, um, it consists of an XML file that uh, creates the skeleton of the, of the app or the structure and then linked to the images that are uh, in a separate folder and once everything is zipped then it's uploaded to Sapelli Collect. Previously a Sapelli project were created by uh, writing XML code and that created some barriers. Um, so now uh, so a couple of years ago um, Excited started um, developing Sapelli Designer that provides an intuitive interface where that people can upload the images and then define the navigation flow of of the app, export the file, and then upload it to Sapelli Collector. Um, the other one um, I'm going to talk a bit uh, later is the Sapelli Progressive Web App. Uh, it's a prototype that tries to integrate um, the data collection functionalities and the data visualization functionalities, and adding the offsite mapping. Uh, capabilities okay the progressive web app and the sapelli collector are the two tools that i'll talk a bit more these are some of the some of the case studies uh, that have used or are using uh, sapelli collector here uh, i'm only showing the the initial screen of each sapelli project so the, the projects follow a decision tree structure. So for instance, here, when they, uh, the users click on the tree, there's another set of icons that appear uh, and so on. The, the complexity of the decision trees uh, varies a lot depending on the, on the project. Some are uh, very uh, simple decision trees. Uh, other ones have uh, up to 200 icons. So it, it, really, it really depends. This first example was uh, co-designed in in the Congo. This other one uh, 
was co-designed with hunter-gatherer communities uh, in Cameroon, in South Cameroon, uh, Kenya. And these two were um, co-designed in, in northeastern Namibia, in the Kalahari, Kalahari Desert. And I hope now that the concept of the Asapeli project is, is, more, is more clear. <clears throat> the next slides, I'm going to focus more on the mapping and the sharing knowledge uh, uh, stages that were shown in the, in the process uh, slide. Uh, and talking about the Nigeria pilot project and the Ethiopia pilot project, where it's both Sapelli Collector and the Sapelli Progressive Web App uh, were used and, and is, is being used. Uh, just a, a, a bit of uh, a bit of context on the on the Nigeria project. That was a, a six uh, months pilot project that ended uh, five, four, four months ago. And the name, the project was named Extreme City in Science uh, in Agriculture, Exagri. And the project kind of lies in the intersection of climate smart agriculture and citizen science. Uh, the, there were like two main goals in the project. One was the primary goal was to see how uh, mapping apps and ICTs could make more efficient the communication between farmers and agricultural station officers. So farmers can report a farming issue and then receive timely advice from the extension officer or other farmer that has uh, experienced the same issue and had found a, a solution. Uh, the other goal was to see uh, how um, farmers can create the their own land use maps that then these can be used uh, to make evidence-based decision and then um, to be shared with uh, <coughs> research-based institution and government agents that can um, uh, make more uh, informed decision based on the location of the farm the type of crop that is facing an issue what type of issue uh, what is the area affected uh, there's we made little progress on this on this second front um, with yeah and this slide it's trust is showing the the way the the two mapping techniques were uh, are represented in the app and the way that they were uh, explained it to the to the different farming communities um the GNSS-based uh, on-site mapping um, is um, is more intuitive because there's on, the, the location is automatically created and there's no need to, to draw uh, a polling on the line or include a point in the map. Uh, research and, and experience shows that um, people, regardless of the previous mapping experience, uh, interpret and understand uh, satellite imagery, especially if there's uh, relevant landmarks in the in the map. But the the, the, the concept of mapping or offside mapping, and especially the, the, the concept of uh, point lines and polygons, it, it takes a bit, it takes a bit uh, more time. And for that, the, the terminology used, we find that it, it's, it's quite important. Uh, so instead of talking about polygons or talking about areas, um, farm sites seem to be an appropriate term to, to capture the concept of, of demarcating a, a plot. Um, the last thing in this slide, um, if you notice in the image on the right hand side, uh, the tablets, uh, so the apps are designed to be used in mobile devices, especially low spec mobile devices um, that have a very limited storage capacity and, and, and the apps that can uh, work offline. But that said, the, the tablets um, are very useful, uh, at least in this context, were very useful for the initial uh, sessions uh, because more people can look at can look at them simultaneously. So the previous slide we um, explained that the, we, we showed that the way we explained the two mapping techniques here um it's how the the two uh, steps for mapping were also introduced uh, so 
first creating the geometry, either by click and uh, capturing the GPS location or click and draw. And then the second steps that uh, take us to the, to the map semantic is describing this geometry. And the apps allow to both do it using the Sapelli project, so the pictorial interfaces, and also the to input in text or using emojis. Okay, um, the way the input bar and the button to open the Sapelli project tries to follow the design that messaging apps follow because the, this is the a design that um, many people are, are familiar with and the emojis is they are controlled by, by very few people uh, so it's a way of, of of adapting and kind of emulating the, the concept uh, somehow um, this this is showing uh, two examples of, of contributions in one uh, using text and capturing the location with GPS and explaining what is the issue and requesting for advice. And then on the on the right, um, using the offsite uh, mapping technique. Uh, one thing to uh, to mention here is that um, when the farmer sees the actual area of their farms. The, the impression is that the, the, the trust in the system increases because uh, the, the farmer obviously know the location of the farm and the size of the farm. When the system, the information provided by the system matches with what they know, this, is, uh, this increases. Um, so there's no evidence about it, but that's the, that's the impression. And we'll talk more about this and how this connect to, to the agro-pastoralist uh, communities and, and the way they uh, interact with the with the mapping apps in terms of uh, the knowledge sharing um, as I said uh, before the in this case the the, the farmers were more interested in uh, receiving timely advice from extension officer or other farmers rather than creating uh, land use maps there's there wasn't a, a, a the issue of land access and land rights was was not identified by them. So for this reason, we try to adapt uh, mapping to messaging. And in this case, WhatsApp was the, the messaging app used by uh, most of them. So we, we found that it might be a, a good way of, of combining messaging and mapping uh, by integrating the mapping app into uh, integrating uh, quotations here uh, into into WhatsApp. And here you can see one of the contributions and and the discussion that this mapping contribution uh, trigger using audio audio recording. The last slide about the Nigeria pilot project. Um, so all these um, mapping and, and knowledge sharing happened privately uh, in the WhatsApp group. But in in few of the sessions, um, people are starting uh, started mapping um, features in the landscape that are not related to farming because that helped uh, to orientate in the map. So like relevant landmarks, bridges, schools, churches, or inter uh, junctions, and this is one of the examples um, of how um, private community mapping can link to open open mapping. Okay, uh, in this case, we start uh, discussing about uh, the role of open data and, and they decided that uh, the primary school can, can be uh, open data. So instead of clicking the button or sharing with WhatsApp group, the data was shared using the, um, the open data button. Okay. Um, and then the other case study that I will briefly talk about uh, is a, a mapping uh, a mapping project for uh, mapping natural resources uh, in South Ethiopia by uh, agro pastoralist communities, and being water was at the, at the very center of of everything. Uh, this is the the logo of the app that uh, was created, and these are the different features that uh, are being mapped. So these icons were uh, co-designed and. 
you can see there's quite a diverse type of uh, land uses or um, ranges for ponds, uh, farming areas, uh, um, facilities, um, water pumps. And then this all in one screen. So scrolling down, there's around 30 icons or so. And the next screen uh, allows the user to provide uh, information about the perception. Uh, for instance, if, if a water pump is working or not, or if a pond is, is dried up or not. And for that, we use these thumbs up, thumbs down uh, icons that seem to be pretty universal. Uh, they, they've been used in, in a wide range of, of, of case studies. <coughs> so this just to provide a, an overview of, of the semantics uh, that or the, the map legend that we're, we're using this in this project. Uh, very quickly here um, and linking to the, the um, what I mentioned about the, the importance of the of the terminology uh, here the. As I said, they, they were uh, they are uh, agropastoralist communities that walk uh, long distances. So, if in the farming context, the, the fact of seeing the area of a plot increases the, the trust in the system. In this case, something similar happened with the distances. And again, the the the, the way um, the polygon uh, was described or named it is different again. Okay, and the, the, the size of the farm is, is less relevant. And here in the middle, you can see the, the icons that I showed in the previous screen organized and how they look in the app with the captions in, in Amharic and the local language. Okay, uh, again, here the, the screenshot in the middle uh, shows the the app, so it's very similar to the one in shown in the Nigeria case study. Uh, it's just it just changes the the semantics screen. Okay, on the right is the WhatsApp conversation uh, with a picture taken and attached to a geometry, and then on the left, the icon of the progressive web app, the customized progressive web app, and the the shortcut of the of the WhatsApp group. The WhatsApp provides or WhatsApp or messaging apps. Uh, provide uh, some advantages uh, in some contexts because uh, there are quite a few. I'm going to just mention three. Uh, first, it simplifies a lot the te technological implementation because somehow it acts uh, as the backend technology. Um, it acts as a offline storage, so people can share the data when offline and then the data is transmitted when online. Um, it simplifies significantly the concept of data ownership because uh, People can manage who gets in and out in the WhatsApp group, so there's no need for researchers or other people outside the community to manage this. And, and arguably, it, it makes a solution uh, highly scalable. Okay, there's also negative aspects, but just to mention these three that we found in, um, important. And in the same in the same line. Um, why I'm emphasizing a bit the, the, the need for simplifying the, the technical implementation is because in most areas where there's no maps, mm -hmm. the resources are also very limited and the time for learning new technologies are also limited. So this is uh, an approach to try to simplify this, this process uh, while keeping the, the, the process that it is critical in, in, in all participatory mapping activities or participatory design. In a step one, this can happen without technology or, or with appropriate technology. Then these icons can be uh, uploaded and a support team can quickly adapt a progressive web app, create a new subdomain, send it back, and then the mapping can start. The backend can happen in the messaging apps and the, and the mapping can start. If there's no need for customization, that the geometry can be described with text and emojis, then steps one and two can be uh, skip. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to hurry up. There's only four slides left. Um, I'm going to split this diagram in two um, in order to make it a bit a bit more comprehensible. Uh, so the bottom left side uh, talks more about the community mapping, and then the other, the top right, 
talk more about open data driven collaboration. <laughs> Here, just three main features. Um, the driven path that data can take or is taking, um, if, the if the user wants to share the data and send it to a central database, then to share this in a messaging app, only the coordinates and the Zoom level need to be included in the URL. If, there, if the user don't want to send the data to a, a um, central uh, open special database, this can uh, be sent through an encoded GeoJSON. And then the person at the other side, when clicking it, this geometry is automatically added to the a browser local storage, and it's available for offline use. Yeah, Marcos, uh, so. thanks. I just want to give uh, one, one more minute and yes. we'll switch speakers. Yep. OK. Uh, OK, I'm going to skip this slide then. Um, basically, it's talking about the role of OpenStreetMap contributors on processing this data, land professionals feeding back information that is relevant to land users, and then the role of artificial intelligence in filtering, searching, and suggesting relevant contributions. Um, the next two slides talk about, so we split the diagram. These two slides that are coming is about how we can bring together these two parts of the diagram. Um, one is um, that open land use or generated land use big data uh, is a process and, and must be, uh, arguably, must be a process that uh, follows the, its own pace. Because even though the, the knowledge that uh, people that are not in maps is critical, uh, uh, in most cases, uh, people that are not in maps are also vulnerable. So jumping steps uh, brings risk, and this can have uh, negative impacts to local people. And then to finalize, uh, one way of doing it is um, one way of reducing inequality in participation and democratizing uh, the use and production of geographic information is to try to bring ma mapping apps uh, where lay people are and design them the way that people are familiar with and maybe open land big data might come later sorry rob for taking extra minutes thank you that's it it's all good thank you it's very very great presentation uh, i'm going to move uh, forward quickly but thank you uh and um if there's any questions uh folks can just ask in the chat thanks